the Recep Tayyip Erdogan's sporting career has become part of his mythology, reinforcing his image as a salt-of-the-earth leader in tune with the masses. Over the last 10 years, Turkish football has experienced great change. It's become bigger and louder, more commercialized and polarized, entwined ever more with business and politics. So central has Erdogan become to Turkish football that any account of the state of the game today would be bereft without a study of his role. And yet the game and its obsessive, devoted fans also show the limits of his power. The man known by his supporters as Reis, the chief, was born to a poor family in 1954 in Kasim Pasha, a working class district on the shores of Istanbul's Golden Horn. After school, the young Erdogan would work selling stale simit, a circular sesame bread that is Turkey's most popular snack. But what he really wanted to do with his free time was kick a ball around. I loved football, it was my passion, it entered my dreams at night, Erdogan said years later, but my father never gave permission for me to play. According to the sanctioned narrative, Ahmet Erdogan, nicknamed Captain because of his work on the Istanbul ferries, was fiercely against his son's obsession. Football won't feed the belly, he used to growl. The young Tayyip, as he is known, defied his father, sneaking out to play, hiding his football boots in the coal bunker upon his return. Aged 11, Erdogan won a place at an Imam Hatip College, one of Turkey's religious high schools founded to train imams for the nation's mosques. He wasn't particularly hardworking, but excelled in religious studies and sport, and while still at school, he began playing for the amateur side Kamiyatispor. Then, in 1974, a year after graduating from high school, he moved to a team linked to the Istanbul Transport Authority, the IETT, on the recommendation of the team's captain, who was one of Erdogan's neighbors in Kasim Pasha. Twenty years later, when he was on the verge of being elected mayor of Istanbul, Erdogan gave an interview about his footballing career to the newspaper Milliyet. As an up-and-coming Islamist politician, he went to great lengths to weave a strong thread of religiosity into his years as a footballer, explaining that when he played for IETT, he used to lay out his prayer rug and pray in the changing rooms. The same interview also sees Erdogan discuss the most fiercely disputed claim about his footballing career, that he was almost signed by Fenerbahce. He reports that he was on Fenerbahce's transfer list in 1977, but that his hopes evaporated with the departure of the team's manager. Erdogan is a Fenerbahce fan, and some writers believe there is some burnishing of the historical record. But the claim that he could have played for the Canaries would be repeated again and again throughout the course of his political career. Turkey is a deeply polarized nation, and Erdogan's supporters trumpet his footballing experience. A 2017 biopic of his life, for instance, shows him as a child coming on to score the winner in the closing minutes of a 9-9 game with a stunning overhead kick. But skeptics have lined up to cast doubt on Erdogan's footballing career, part of a wider mistrust of his story that also includes a disputed university degree. Journalist Mustafa Hosh compares Erdogan's footballing days to trying to uncover evidence about events that took place almost 100 years ago, describing the events as ambiguous and contradictory. Sono Yalcin, a journalist who's written a 400-page takedown of Erdogan, makes no effort to conceal his contempt. He believes that the entire Fenerbahce story is fabricated. Yalcin also claims that Erdogan spent his first two years at Kamialtispor as an assistant to the kit man, and maintains that he only got on the pitch because of Kasim Pasha pressure exerted on the coach by a neighborhood friend. In the present day, under Erdogan's rule, Turkish football is much changed. Over the last 10 years, greater commercialization has manifested in electronic advertising boards, the stadium being named after corporations and the broadening ranges of club merchandise, from beer holders to baby grows. But Turkish football also has additional features that even the hyper-commercialized English Premier League has yet to implement. On the team's shirts, the players' names are relegated to below the squad numbers. The more visible spot across the shoulder blades is given over to adverts. And, during live games on the television, the screen periodically shrinks to allow a banner advertising a petrol brand to flash across the bottom. The Super League has become the seventh wealthiest football league in Europe by revenue, and many people are grateful to Erdogan personally for that development. Many including Yildirim Demiore, the president of the Turkish Football Federation, who in 2017 thanked Erdogan specifically for allowing the game in Turkey to gather the fruits of his leadership. Erdogan is of course not solely responsible for all of this. Perceptions matter though, and many across Turkey view the transformation of the country as not simply presided over by Erdogan, but having stemmed directly from his words and actions. 
football remains a central part of Erdogan's big man persona, the political conception in which a leader is both a father figure and a hero. In a country in which the game is entwined with notions of virile masculinity, it's an ideal tool with which to bolster her reputation. And he was still taking part in games well into his 60s. At a charity match in 2014, he scored a hat-trick with some surprisingly decent finishing. Erdogan's displays of sporting prowess are reminiscent of those of Russian President Vladimir Putin. Erdogan frequently descends to the dressing room after matches to congratulate players, and he is forever taking penalties at the opening of new stadiums or football conferences, which are always widely documented. The first goal from Erdogan, the sports newspaper photo match reported on the opening of the new Trabzonspor Stadium in December 2016. Next to the picture, the newspaper placed a star that read, A Masterstroke. Perhaps the largest change to sports in Turkey under the AKP has been the surge in sports construction. From neighborhood astroturf pitches to world-class stadiums, every level of the sports pyramid has seen huge investment in infrastructure. Many thousands now have affordable and accessible sports amenities close to their homes and schools. New sports facilities are part of a wider construction boom that has swept across the cities of Turkey. This restless movement is not a consequence, but a cause. In a country in which construction and its affiliated industries make up about 20% of the economy, permanent building keeps the economy afloat. Pride of place in the building spree has been given to Erdogan's beloved mega projects. They include a third bridge across the Bosphorus and a road tunnel and metro line that run under it. In 2015, construction began on a third airport, due to be the world's busiest with six runways. Football stadiums too are an important example of the policy in action. Turkey has become UEFA's leading builder of new stadiums. Between 2007 and 2015, 18 new grounds were built. 11 cities all have, or in 2019 are soon to get, a new stadium. Nearly all follow the same pattern. An old stadium, built in the 40s or 50s, is knocked down. It will have been part of the Republican project, located in a central area alongside a park or some other recreational space, and named either after Atatürk himself or key dates from the Turkish War of Independence. By contrast, the new stadiums are named after sponsors or the municipality. They often stand on the outskirts of the city and are mostly owned by the government and leased to the clubs. Consequently, the old city centre plots can be sold off by the TOKI, the government housing agency, to developers for a lucrative price. In many ways, Turkey is going through a process that the UK underwent in the 1990s, when the governance and infrastructure of the game was rapidly overhauled. But safety and comfort were not the only motivations. Stadiums are now seen as a vital source of revenue. According to Konzatsi, the sale of boxes at the new Galatasaray Stadium, plus 2,500 VIP seats on a three-year contract, earned the club 80 million US dollars. Some go as far to say that the stadium's existence is solely due to the opportunity to award a construction project and enrich friends. Turkey isn't Russia, there is no cultural everyday mini-bribes to traffic police or civil servants, but business is riddled with conflicts of interest and corruption. In Turkey, many construction companies are part of a wider portfolio of business interests. It has been alleged that in return for contracts, they've been asked to acquire newspapers and TV channels and ensure that they turn out obsequious coverage. Local politicians jostle to have the best projects built in their patch as a way of showing their power and influence. Stadiums are constructed less as community facilities and more as money makers and status symbols. Bestowing a new stadium on a town is one of the gifts that Erdogan, the big man, can dole out in exchange for support. But there's also a flip side. Erdogan was subjected to his first ever large-scale public booing at the opening of the new Galatasaray ground in January 2011. The team's fans are convinced that this act has had repercussions, insisting that the horrendous traffic problems around the ground are caused because a second access road was denied planning permission, supposedly an act of punishment for the fans' behavior. The changing physical landscape of Turkish football has been accompanied by a parallel development, a remodeling of the profile of those who watch the game. On the 14th of April 2011, the Turkish parliament passed the Law to Prevent Violence and Disorder in Sport, or the 6222 Law, which was aimed at stamping out problems at sports events by establishing a brand new framework of regulations. In Turkey in 2018, it's no longer possible to buy an old-fashioned ticket to a football match, at least in the top two leagues. Everyone in the stadium must have what's known as a Pasilik card. This holds the fan's name and surname, their ID number and a photo. Tickets for games are purchased online and added to the card. 
On the 10th of April 2016, Erdogan stepped out onto the turf of the Vodafone Arena, the brand new Besiktas Stadium, three years in the making. Lessons had been learned from the opening ceremony from the Galatasaray game five years earlier. This time, the stands were empty. The Besiktas president Fikret Orman made a speech in which he addressed Erdogan as Dear President, Venerable President, or the People's President, no fewer than 13 times, angering many Besiktas fans with his obeisance. But Orman knew his football club had to exist in Erdogan's Turkey. Famous players, including the then Barcelona star Arda Turan, took part in an online campaign backing Erdogan and prior to the 2018 World Cup, Mesut Ozil and Ilkay Gundogan invited controversy by posing for pictures with him. In a political landscape divided starkly into friends and enemies, many influential companies and organizations know on which side they want to be. But football in Turkey is not completely cowed. At a time when Erdogan is accused of controlling all aspects of life, from the judiciary to the media and the business world, his reach into the big three football clubs of Galatasaray, Fenerbahce and Besiktas is perhaps more limited. With their enormous cultural clout and vast numbers of fans, they are difficult to conquer. The AKP has thrown its weight behind efforts to create new teams such as Istanbul's Besiktas and Osmanlispor in Ankara. On the pitch, Besik Shehir have been giving the more established sides a run for their money. They finished second in 2016-17 and narrowly missed out on qualifying for the Champions League. But the club is a long way from rivaling the broad appeal of Fenerbahce, Galatasaray and Besiktas. And for Erdogan, stepping out onto the pitch in front of the rowdy, unpredictable fans of the big three teams remains politically risky. This video was adapted from a story that originally appeared in The Blizzard, written by John McManus. The Blizzard is a quarterly football magazine edited by Jonathan Wilson. It's football journalism for people who think about the game more than everyone else. You can click the link below to subscribe or find out more. And handily, The Blizzard is also beautifully designed and they make wonderful gifts for friends and family. So visit theblizzard.co.uk for more information and thank you for watching.